Well, I'll turn in your Bibles to Romans chapter 8. As you're turning there, let me just make a few remarks. We often uh, get used to hearing certain phrases when someone is really performing their task well. Uh, like a quarterback who just completes pass after pass after pass. Or in my world, a guitar player who just seems to be on a different level of improvisation and nailing it. That's one of the phrases we use, nailing it. Or on fire, they're just unstoppable. Often it's something like we say, in the zone, as if the zone is this mental or emotional place where you're just focused and not distracted and confident even. And this is the reason for that great execution. He's in the zone. Well, this is kind of carried over into Christian vocabulary. And in my older, previous, charismatic Pentecostal days, you know what I'm talking about, brother. Um, if someone was really into it, like during the music, and they're closing their eyes, and they're raising their hands, what would we say? They're really in the spirit. Someone's preaching or witnessing powerfully with confidence and courage. You would, he's really in the spirit, man. He's, he's being led. He's in the spirit. Well, there is a category for that extra push in that sense. But really, the message today is very simple. If you're a Christian, then you're not in the flesh. You're in the spirit. And your resurrection from the dead is just as sure as Jesus's resurrection from the dead. So let's read our text this morning. I'll be focusing really on three verses, nine through 11. Beginning in verse nine, however, you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if indeed the spirit of God dwells in you. But if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him. If Christ is in you, Though the body is dead because of sin, yet the spirit is alive because of righteousness. But if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. First, following from last week, there's a great contrast. If you remember last week, those in the flesh cannot keep God's law. They cannot obey God. In fact, Paul goes so far as to say that someone who's in the flesh can't do anything pleasing to God. And when Paul's talking about unbelievers, he uses words like them or those, not you. It's those in the flesh. Now he says, referring to the church, to whom he's writing, he says, you, however. You ever hear somebody try to downplay the idea of the exclusivity of the church? And they go that extra step and say, well, you're making it about us versus them. Well, it's that little word versus that really is the issue. Of course, there's an us and them. How many times have I said, though, God's uh, view of mankind is absolutely binary. I'm not talking about the sexes. I'm talking about in Adam, in Christ, for me or against me, all of those. And Paul is doing the same thing. You, in contrast with last week's those or them. See, it's not that we're enemies of unbelievers. We're supposed to love our enemies. But there's a, there's a reason that the modern church usually has a very, very low bar when it comes to church membership because they want to make sure people don't feel like they're being excluded from anything. They have to downplay the reality of God's judgment on sin and sinners and you know, downplay those aspects of God that the modern world just finds distasteful. You know, his holiness, his absolute standard of justice and righteousness, all of that stuff. And by the way, in there's another thing that gets downplayed, and that's God's glorifying himself, which is really what drives everything we do here. Everything in, 
in the worship of any reformed church is going to be God's glory. And what does the unbeliever say to that? Well, isn't that arrogant? We're talking about the creator of the universe here. It couldn't be arrogant any more than anything else. So. so last week we established the idea that obedience to God's law is really in view when we deal with chapters 7 and 8. And also, more importantly, that a person's attitude towards their, the law of God, and then that results also in obedience to God's commands, that's a good index or indicator of that person's true relationship with God. Now back in, in verses seven and eight, last week again, we saw that in subordination to God's covenant stipulations, that is his revealed will, God has spoken, we can read it, it's in the Bible, we know what he expects of us, that if someone is just in rebellion against that, it's really a concrete reality that demonstrates that person's State of enmity, enmity is like a hostile to God. That was the, was the title last week. It shows a real state of hostility between God and that person. Again, this is not uncommon these days. People will take what's in the Bible, they'll say, I want to be a Christian, but then I want to shave off these edges because it doesn't really fit with my view of things or maybe society's view. But then... Is there a way in which this observed obedience to the law can, what I call, go to seed? Can it, can it be abused? Of course it can. Just think of any community where outward conformity is expected. And yes, I would include the Amish and Mennonites here because that's part of that culture. You don't see a good Amish kid walking around in cutoffs in a tank top, unless they're in Rumspring, I guess. That's probably the easiest example. Um, outward conformity, right? Here's the, here's the reality, though. No one can really be in true, heartfelt obedience to God's law unless they've been born from above. It's always going to be back to the old, keeping the law in order to be justified or to be seen as justified. Even the, even the American Puritans, who I really love, you know, they're, they're the ones that had the bedrock ideas upon which all of this, you know, representative republic and democratic type of government comes from. But they had some weird rules that, you know, if you didn't conform to them, it would be seen, oh, you're not really, you're not really obedient to God anymore. But we're not talking about external rule, we're talking about God's law, which, by the way, the Sermon on the Mount is Christ's exposition on the law of God. It really has to do with the motives. So true, spirit-led service to God, worship, real heartfelt obedience to the law of God, that marks out the nature of a heart that has really been changed. Like our, our Old Testament reading this, this morning from Ezekiel, God takes out the heart of stone a heart of stone can't respond. It's stubborn. It's willful. It stays hard and just implacable. And God replaces that with a heart of flesh, one that is able to respond, willing to obey Jesus in all of those ways. It's really, a, I'm going to go out on a limb here. It's the right relationship between the law and grace. The law no longer standing over us as a, terror or as a, a barrier between us and our true desires. Again, that's really popular. You want to be an authentic self. Oh boy, you don't know my authentic self. <laughs> or true to yourself. Be who you are. No, be like Christ. That's really the, the idea there. And I mentioned, I think it was last week or not, if I repeat myself, blame the old. Um, but we see God's law now, not as a barrier, but as a protective covenant fence. We just, we just discussed in Sunday school how sometimes God's wrath and judgment on a people takes the form of allowing them to do exactly what they want and bearing the consequences. So where grace is present and where grace abounds, 
there you're going to see the fruits of that grace. And one of the fruits of that grace is going to be manifest in heartfelt obedience to God's moral law. I love what, what Greg Bonson says. He says, it is quite possible to take an avid interest in the commandments of God and still have a heart that is far from the Lord. And still have a lifestyle which is anything but pleasing to God since our attitudes and motives are out of line with the moral guidance of Scripture. So all that to say it is possible to put on a show, a front of obedience where it's really not coming from the heart. That doesn't change the fact, though, that Paul this whole time has been using obedience to the law as that bellwether of a person's relation with God. Now, I have three points this morning, and they're just kind of obvious from the text. The first one is the Spirit is in you. The second, the Spirit is life. And the third, the Spirit is resurrection. So let's go to the first, first point this morning. The Spirit is in you. In verse 9, again, there's that obvious contrast between how we ended last week with the mindset on the flesh and in the flesh with these phrases in the Spirit, also His Spirit who dwells in you. Remember how I said that Paul uses the word Spirit a whole bunch of times in chapter 8, where before in Romans 1 through 7, it's like once, twice. Here it's 22. And that's because a right understanding and application of the Spirit of God is the key to walking in obedience to God and his law and to the, to the Christian life. It's the fundamental, think, think of it this way, it's the absolute fundamental bedrock distinction and difference between an unbeliever and a believer. The unbeliever is still in the flesh. Very simple. And the Christian is in the spirit and he's been redeemed from that previous law of sin and death. And notice, just a quick survey here, how the Spirit is referred to just in these three verses. He's the Spirit. He's the Spirit of God. He's also referenced as the Spirit of Christ. Now, I would even say that the phrase Christ in you is a reference to the Spirit. Then we have the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead. That's the Spirit of the Father. And then his spirit. And note, these are not different spirits. There's one Holy Spirit. These are all in reference to the different aspects of all three persons of the Trinity in salvation and in relation to one another. We should not conclude from this that the Spirit, that the Holy Spirit and the Lord Jesus are exactly the same. But only that they're inseparable in terms of not only nature, one being, three persons, but of the saving benefits that are communicated to all believers. Texts like these, too, if you, if you think about it, you know, someone, someone will often say, well, I just want one Bible verse that says, and then fill in whatever doctrine it is. And I always say, okay, now do the Trinity. I want one Bible verse that explicitly says God is one being three persons. No, we take all of Scripture, comparing Scripture with Scripture, the analogy of faith, the analogy of Scripture. It's what systematic theology is. As soon as you say, here's what the Bible says about this or that, you're in systematic theology. You're, you're looking at all of the texts that provide all the information that we need. So texts like this, Romans uh, 8, 9 through 11, provide what we call the raw material from which the church later more carefully and in, in a more detailed way described and codified what we know as the doctrine of the Trinity. There's another word in here, and it kind of bookmarks and bookends the passage. It's the word dwell. That word there is oikeo. Does it sound familiar? Oiko. What, what is, anyone tell me, what is Oiko in the, in the New Testament. Household, right, house, household. So here it's used in the sense of occupying that house to inhabit 
or to reside in. Similar to the language that Paul uses in Ephesians 2, verses 19 through 22, he says, so then you, again, you, them, (laughs) it's you, are no longer strangers and aliens, but are fellow citizens with the saints and are of God's household. Having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone in whom the whole building being fitted together is growing into a temple, holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together into a dwelling of God the Spirit. So all that All that language is very metaphorical, symbolic, temple, household, dwelling. He's he's talking about you, the church, you in the new covenant. You are, your bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit. When you come together to worship, we don't come to a temple. We come to this building. We, you know, technically this is an auditorium. I don't even say sanctuary. I'm just weird that way, but, you know, holy place. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll give him that much. But really, we gather together as God's people. And God uses this language of household, building, dwelling, tabernacle, temple, to speak of his people. And in this passage this morning, isn't it great? You're not in the flesh, in the spirit. The spirit of God dwells in you. And then in verse uh, 11, the spirit who dwells in you. See, there's no more temple in Jerusalem. You're the temple. As the church, you're together with all of the Christians everywhere from the very beginning and in every place, like our friends in in Liberia. How how many are on the uh, Syracuse Baptist, the the special page for following? Don't you love, Dwana is just constantly sending us updates, updates. Here they are sewing school uniforms. Here they are putting you know, mortar into the old concrete wall. That's, that's the church. That's the temple. We're united to those people because we're all united to Jesus. That's, that's what we're talking about here. And we're continually being built into a temple where God dwells as the Spirit of God makes his abode, his dwelling in the realm of every Christian's life And this is central in the life of any believer. Paul writes as much, even in 1 Timothy 3, he says, I'm writing these things to you, hoping to come to you before long. But in case I'm delayed, here's why he wrote that letter. I write you so that you know how to conduct conduct yourself in the household of God, which is the church of the living God. So let me read verse 9 again. You, however, contrasting with those in the flesh, you, however, are not in the flesh, but in the spirit, If, in fact, the Spirit of God dwells in you, and anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him. Now, we can see here, these aren't verses that are telling us what we need to do. These are indicative passages telling us how it is. This is what's real. But let's back up a little bit. What does it mean when he says, in the Spirit? As I mentioned earlier, there are all kinds of assumptions that people bring to the table when they hear that phrase, in the spirit. You know, back in my charismatic days, we kind of made a concession to those who didn't speak in tongues and say, well, yeah, you, uh, you have the spirit, but you don't have all the spirit. Or you have the spirit, but there's so much more. You need that second work of grace. And of course, Tim's redeemed junior high boy says, oh, forget second work of grace. I need 10, 12, 18 per day. You know, I need a lot of the work of grace in my heart, you know. But there's a difference between regeneration and what the Bible calls full of the Spirit. I acknowledge that. Remember I talked about that, the guy who's, let's, let's say someone's in front of the abortion clinic And they're not just yelling in a bullhorn. They're preaching the gospel, and you can feel the conviction. Boom, he's in the Spirit. The Bible would say that that person's full of the Spirit, filled with the Spirit. Uh, We see that in the book of Acts when he's referring to Stephen. You know, right before they started throwing rocks at him, the Bible says, Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, filled with the Spirit. 
that last boost of, of courage, what it took to stand up against those very people who had crucified Christ and to call them to repentance. And their response, of course, was to kill him. Barnabas, it is also said, was full of the Spirit. You know who else was said to be full of the Spirit? The Lord Jesus Christ, right before he went to the desert to be tempted. So there is that aspect of being full of the Spirit. But here, Paul's point is much simpler. If you're a believer, then you're in the Spirit and you have the Holy Spirit and you can please God in distinction from verse 8 where the, the person of the flesh cannot. See, if you don't have the Spirit, then you're still in the flesh and you can't please God. And those lacking the Spirit of Christ do not belong to Christ. They're what the Bible calls unbelievers. They're still in the flesh. And see, this, this being in the Spirit is not like an emotional state of being. It's not an experiential series of moments where you're really in a more favorable condition to hear God talk to you. And again, we're contrasting it the whole time. It's, it speaks of this radical change of nature. My, my friend, Ed, Ed Dingus, I mentioned him earlier, he did a great response to some of the, you know, the traditionalist theologians out there that are trying to deny the reality of original sin, of man's natural state in sin. He says, we, we get used to hearing this, but this, this was a radical change. When God took out your heart of stone and put in a heart of flesh, that was a change in your nature. I'm, are you still you? Yeah, in fact, you're more you than you were before. But it means then you can respond positively, positively to God. You're no longer operating under the power and tyranny of sin. You've been born from above. And you're in the Spirit. John Gill writes this, quote, the inhabitation of the Spirit is a distinguishing character of a regenerate man. Illuminating, regenerating, sanctifying, and faith as a comforter, the Spirit of adoption. The Spirit acts as an intercessor, as a pledge and seal of joy, which inhabitation is personal and it's expressive. Here's, here's his point. In the Spirit is expressive of the property and dominion of the Spirit in that person's life. Remember, back a few months ago, you're gonna to have to serve somebody. It's either the devil or it's the Lord. No one's autonomous, no one's their own agent out here. And you see the idea here is one of union with, with and under the sovereign creator of all things. This change in dominion has occurred for those who are united to Jesus by faith and have begun to taste the, the fruits of the coming age, the new heavens and the new earth. You know, there's this idea too, we, we get used to thinking in, in spatial terms. Remember, ask Jesus into your heart and you're like, okay. You know what that means, of course. It doesn't mean there's a literal physicality to it. The meaning behind it's good, although I, I will say this, it, it kind of ends up being this soft, warm, fuzzy appeal to be a Christian. Really, I like the apostles' gospel. Therefore, having overlooked times of ignorance, you know, that's gonna go well at, at uh, a modern church. You're ignorant. <laughs> what you worship in ignorance, I'm gonna talk to you about. Hovering overlooked the times of ignorance, God is now declaring to men, to all people everywhere should repent because he's fixed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness through a man whom he has appointed, having furnished proof to all men by raising him from the dead. What would we say? That'll preach. That's, that's a sermon right there. But all of that said, the idea of the, the spirit of God dwelling in you isn't to be understood as a space but rather as being the spirit now reigns in, what does the Bible call the center of your affections and emotions? It's the heart. He reigns in your very nature. It's another way of pointing to our union with Jesus and by extension of, of all God is and all that he has. See, the contrast, it's, it's simpler than trying to make some 
strange ethereal connection with being in the spirit. It's really between believers and unbelievers, between those who are in the flesh and those who are of the spirit. So that's our first point. The spirit is in you, Christian. Second, the spirit is life. Verse 10, if Christ is in you, though the body is dead because of sin, yet the spirit is alive because of righteousness. Now, let me ask a question. If you have your Bible, in verse 10, how many have the Spirit in a capital letter? Capitalized. Does anyone have it in a small letter S? Yes, I, I see the NASB reader over here. <laughs> well, I'm going to go out on a limb and I'm going to have to Go ahead and disagree with you there. With the, with the NASB, that is. This is my Bible of choice. NIV, right. You know, that Bible started hanging around with the wrong crowd, and it's just never recovered. Pains me to say. So, this is interesting, because you may know that every time the word pneuma is used, it doesn't automatically mean the Holy Pneuma, the Holy Spirit. Case in point, if you drop down to verse 15 of Romans 8, the word is used in a different way. He says, for you have not received a spirit of slavery leading to fear, but you have received a spirit of adoption as sons. Well, there the word is used to describe a a vital principle or a, or a mental disposition. So why is there a small s here in my NASB and in the NIV, where in the English Standard Version and the King James Version, the s is capitalized? By the way, this is not a textual issue. It's not a textual variant. It's one of those very, very rare translation issues that are affected by interpretation. It really is. Uh, hardly ever happens, by the way. Those people that want to attack the Bible will say it's everything, and I'm like, it's almost nothing. It, it didn't take place like that. And there's really no doctrine affected by these differences here in, in uh, verse 10. The ESV capitalizes, and it says also, instead of the Spirit is alive, it says the Spirit is life. And the King James is very similar. It's not the Spirit is alive because of righteousness, but rather it's the Spirit is life because of righteousness. Why the difference? Well, in the last few centuries, the majority would agree with the New American Standard. That is comparing, here it is, though the body is dead with the Spirit is alive. That kind of makes sense, right? It's not crazy. They are sort of in parallel with each other. However, one commentator recently said that the issue is what comes up in verse 11, the very next verse, which is resurrection by the Spirit. He's probably thinking of that passage even in Ezekiel 36 from this morning, or maybe at the uh, uh, the part of Ezekiel 37, where in the vision of the dry bones, God says, I will put my spirit within you and you will come to life. So why do the bones come to life? It's because of the spirit. That spirit is the means by which Israel was going to be resurrected. Paul, thinking in those categories. And here's the other thing. The word for alive in life is the word zoe. There used to be a Christian metal band called Zoe, life. Their music sounded not very lively. No, they were, they were fun. Good guys. And Tom Schreiner makes the claim here that this is never, not one time, translated as alive. It's always life. And, to be honest, John Calvin agrees with him. So does John Murray. They're of the opinion here that Paul's main thrust is to point believers to the source of life and to the surety of their own future. See, believers will be raised to life from the dead through the Spirit who gives life and all on the basis of what's Romans about, the righteousness of God. 
Dikaio the, Theos, the righteousness of God, his saving righteousness, and this is in spite of the fact that our physical bodies are dead in the sense of it's going to happen, death and taxes. There are two things you can count on because of sin. So the Spirit indwells believers, and they are no longer slaves of sin, and yet they still die because of sin. Sin is no longer the master, but this doesn't mean that sin is non-existent. So your physical body, if you're a believer this morning, and includes the whole person, indicates that we Christians are still part of that old age, even though we possess this new age, and I don't mean that in the weird sense, I mean age, of the Spirit, and full redemption is coming someday. So right now we're enjoying the already part of being redeemed. We've been set free from the law of sin and death and we're guaranteed a resurrection because Jesus rose from the dead. He proved everything from, from, from that vantage point of risen from the dead. And Tom Schreiner says this, full redemption will come at the day of resurrection when all sin and weakness will be left behind. So the point of verse 10 is to lead us now to verse 11. The spirit is life. The spirit is resurrection. Verse 11, but if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. See, in, in union with Jesus, we've talked about this a lot, all that is Christ's is yours. Christ's resurrection is yours. It's just as physical as his. Recently, I was having a discussion with a fellow pastor, and he was trying to deny some of that very important stuff from Romans 5. You know, in Adam, in Christ, condemned, made alive, all of those things. And I said, you know, Romans teaches that through one man, sin entered the world and death came from sin. And he said, why do you come to the conclusion that that word death there is physical? Couldn't it just be spiritual? And I said, well, in Romans, the word death is used 25 times and 20 of them refer to physical death. The other five we've been talking about, metaphorical, law of sin and death. It's, it's not li literally death there, although sin always leads to death. And here's the kicker. If the death that is spoken of all through Romans 5 isn't physical, then eternal life through Christ Jesus isn't physical either. Do you understand the connection there? You want to be consistent. The Bible clearly says that Jesus physically rose from the dead. Well, that means that someday you too will physically rise from the dead. Vody Bauckham says he, he thinks the funniest verse in the Bible is, you know, Genesis 3, who told you you were naked? You know, I think one of the funniest ones is when Jesus, in front of his disciples, as they're freaking out, losing their minds, they don't know what to do, and he just says, do you have anything to eat? <laughs> Think of think about the, the context. Yeah, yeah, I could use a bite. I'm kind of hungry. <laughs> but it's physicality. It's physical. And I could have pointed forward right to this verse. It's explicit that what is in view here is the reality that we live in corruptible bodies physical, mortal bodies. And yet, those bodies, are, has your heart been transformed? Yes, then your body's going to be transformed too. Even though this side of eternity, we still experience physical death. So if you look at, at verse 11, there's, there's four things. Basically, you can take away. First of all, it's God the Father raised Jesus from the dead. 
That's, but the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead. And in this context, the Holy Spirit is called the spirit of the Father. Remember earlier, it was the spirit of Christ. It's really, it's not intended to confuse at all. This is very Trinitarian language. And the third point is that same spirit also dwells, dwells in all believers. So it's not like in the old charismatic days where you got some of the spirit or part of it, whatever. No, it's the spirit in his fullness dwells in Christians. And then finally, this indwelling of the spirit guarantees our resurrection, our own resurrection. See, we can know this because our resurrection is empowered by the same spirit that rose Jesus Christ from the dead. It's the exact same Holy Spirit of God. This is what it means to be in the Spirit. I'm going to close with this. First of all, you've been regenerate. If you, if you haven't been regenerated, then you can't repent and believe in the gospel. We just we covered that last week. It's impossible. So if you're here this morning, you love Christ, you got a good attitude towards the law of God, you've been born from above. He comes to dwell in and with you. To be in the Spirit means that the Spirit has made you his dwelling place. It means peace with God. It means a wellness of relationship. This is why we take some time every Lord's Day to con confess our sin, to acknowledge, first of all, our own sin, and to confess it, and to repent. As Pastor Kevin said earlier, it, it displeases God when we sin. It, it, it sets his disposition against that sin. So we want to say, I don't want to have anything to do with that. I repent. And, and move ahead. Be forgiven. It also means, to be in the Spirit means that God is in the process of renovating. It's like you, you buy an old house, and you purchase the house, and it's a mess. There's mold, gunk, joists that need replaced. But hey, it's your house. Well, that's the way it is. When God saved you, it was an old house. It needed renovation. Even though there's a time where before you weren't God's, now you are. Now God dwells in you. He renovates your, the house of your life. I've, I've said for a long time that, you know, when I, when I think of my own growth as a Christian, sometimes I, I'm like, wow, I should be a lot farther along. But it's like, it's like when you're first saved, you go up in the attic of your heart, if you want to say it that way, and you turn the light on and you can see a bunch of cobwebs and gunk and the cat's been up there. It's a mess. You need, you need, you need to repent. Clean up. Well, the more light then you get, the more you see into the corners and the little recesses and the cubby holes and you go, oh, that's sin too. And your attitude isn't, yeah, but that hurts. I don't know. That might offend my friends. Your attitude is, let God be true. Let every man a liar. So that renovation is what it means to be in the spirit and then one day, someday, a long time from now, I'm thinking, but after you're dead, you will be raised to eternal life with all the saints from everywhere, from every time and place. And you will see him, as we read in 1 John this morning, we will see him as he is. My friends, this, this truth, again, it's not, it's not telling you what to do. It's telling you how it is. But how you respond and think about this then is going to drive your obedience to God, your concern, your attitude towards the things of God, and even your attitude and concern toward others who are also bought by the blood of Christ. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for the gift of your spirit. We thank you for the regenerating power of the spirit. We think that in you is life and light and blessing. And apart from you, Lord, we know is, is the curse of the law of sin and death. Lord, I pray for all of us this morning that 
that we will take these truths and uh, apply them to our own lives, that we wouldn't be trying your patience, that we would keep short accounts with you, and that, Lord, as you would encourage us to continue on the pilgrim's progress towards the celestial city, give us strength and courage and empowerment through your spirit. We ask it all for your glory. In Christ's name, amen.